The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Statements made by hosts or guests reflect their own beliefs and opinions and is not investment advice. The hosts or guests may have personal investments in any assets being discussed. All right, everyone. Welcome to the DeFi podcast. Uh, this week, we have Erwin on the pod. Erwin's the head of Gen AI at Chorus One. Chorus One's a major validator group in the blockchain space. Hey, Erwin. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for inviting me. Good. Glad to be here. It's the first time yeah. as, a, as a guest in a podcast, so uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, because you have your own podcast, so you should be, um, you should be um, well-versed, right? Well, <laughs> I think uh, Luis does a better job than I do. Yeah, no, this should be fun. So um, we also have uh, Bill on the podcast, uh, obviously. Uh, Bill is a regular co-host. Um, he's the founder of Daybreak Digital, a very cool VC fund in New York. Hey, Bill, how are you? Hey, what's up, man? How are you doing? Thank you for that intro. Appreciate it. Resident Chad <laughs> of the podcast. Resident Chad. We're working on nicknames. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're still like uh, sort of uh, modeling different, different names and there's a lot of fails involved. <laughs> but I don't hate Resident Chad. <laughs> All right. Um, next, uh, we have Brett, um, the founder of Gravita, also the founder of Upcoming Avant. Uh, some people call him the Elon Musk of crypto. Uh, hey, Brett, how are you? Three weeks in a row of not being the Elon Musk of crypto, but doing well. And next, we have uh, Jared, the uh, original crypto tinkerer, uh, has been in the space forever. Um, senior analyst at Google Poll. How are you, Jared? Good. Getting more DGen in crypto day by day. <laughs> All right. Uh, and finally, I'm JF. I'm your host. I'm the uh, head of DeFi at Google Pool, and I'm an advisor to uh, Avant as well. Uh, so a bit later in the discussion, we're going to jump into validation and ACP 77. But uh, first, there's a couple of things we want to address. So um, Pavel Durov, the uh, founder and CEO of uh, Telegram, uh, jailed by the French authorities this week. Uh, I believe he was released from jail. Uh, but uh, he is being charged for being complicit in managing an online platform that allows or to allow illicit transactions by organized groups. Yeah, so just curious um, to throw that to the panel. Um, actually, maybe Bill, you can start us off. Um, just thoughts on this uh, happening. Sure. Yeah, so look, I mean, I, so I have a lot of stuff to say about this. Number one, the guy, is a, the, guy the CEO, Pavel, is a really fascinating guy. I didn't know that much about him until recently. He started doing some interviews. The guy was born in the Soviet Union, left and came back. It's a long story. It's really cool. You should uh, go read about his background. Really fascinating dude, but has started this chat program that now has a billion users. That's massive. You know, we have like so many different chat apps, uh, 15 or 20 different chat apps that we're, we're forced to use to keep in touch with people. And somehow Telegram is you know, uh, captured a billion users. So they're doing something right. And my initial take was, look, when they said that they arrested him because, you know, there's crime happening on the platform, like that's the allegation, you know, that you, I, I think you could say that basically about every platform, every chat messaging app, you could probably find a criminal using the chat app to conduct, you know, something that's illegal. Um, so I, I don't really buy that as an excuse. Telegram itself released a public statement saying that, um, Basically, that they comply with all regulations. I mean, I have no idea if that's true or not, <clears throat> but it definitely feels like there's some sort of, you know, backdoor, like political motivations happening that we have no idea about and probably will never know. You know, mm -hmm. um, one thing that was being floated on Twitter was that maybe the governments, you know, some governments want them to install some sort of a backdoor into the system and he's refusing to do that. Again, we have no way of knowing that's true. But when, when I saw that, the thing that I, uh, thought to myself, and I'd love to get your guys' thoughts about this part, is that I just assume that every single chat app has a backdoor. Like there is no chat app where the stuff that you say is private because you just have to trust that the companies are not working on something in the backdoor, like in, in, a, in some sort of back room with, with the government, right? So like even Signal. Signal has been famous for, you know, allegedly being very well encrypted, but then there are rumors that, for example, the NSA can read your messages. Uh, so credible rumors. So I don't know, maybe I'll just pause there for a second and say, like, you know, when you guys use these chat apps, like, you know, do you assume that everything that you're saying, you know, everything that we type can be monitored? What, what do you guys think? And actually, um, I, I'd love for Erwin to go first, because uh, Erwin, you have, you have a background in, in cryptography, uh, number one. And number two, uh, I, I believe, of course, one has offices in, in Europe. So just, just curious, like, from a mm -hmm. cryptographic point of view, like what you think about um, maybe Signal versus uh, Telegram, if you have any opinions there. And then yeah. if... Um, 
sort of what, what what's the reality on the ground in Europe? Uh, are people thinking about this differently than in the U.S. since this happened in Europe? Yeah, so uh, there's definitely a lot to unpack there. Like, the I think like the yes, I I personally assume that like things can essentially, if not now, it it will be it essentially will be decrypted or or views at some point in the future. And so like, but this is um, this is okay. Like, it can work with uh, without, without revealing in the same way that when you're recording in an interview, you don't show like your API keys or something like that when when it's over there. I don't uh, kind of send passwords or anything like that. In fact, uh, like it's just kind of sanitization, right? Like you do, you you just follow common practices. But like the the fact that like the there is a movement on like from government enforcers for, like to try to go in the, uh, and implement backdoors on software is well known and documented. Like and in fact, PGP, like the original cryptography program, was. Uh, was uh, so much of a of a, of a secret like that uh, they had to be exported from the U.S. by printing on a book, and the guy printed the whole code source code of PGP on a book and then went uh, outside the U.S. and then kind of encoded it again because the the law only protected the source uh, source code. So they are they are looking at it and they want they want to see like what we can do and that's actually why I came into crypto. Like uh, to be honest, like uh, what I want me, uh, most, uh, most and foremost is censorship resistance. Like that's it. And that's when people joke about like, ah, I want a decentralized Twitter or a decentralized Telegram. You say like, ah, there is kind of no solution to uh, governments trying to install backdoors or Telegram and so on. Well, I think that crypto has kind of cri- crypto the, the industry and like censorship resistance by the, the decentralization, permissionless decentralization is a solution for that. So if we ever manage to kind of rally to the right cause and right kind of a, a decentralized telegram or, or signal or whatever, um, with, a, I don't know, fully homomorphic encryption or, or something like that. Yeah, that, that, that I say, uh, that's why I work here. Like, uh, gotcha, Erwin, can I ask you a quick question about that? Because as being a US resident, I actually don't have access to any of the crypto rails of of Telegram, right? So like from my understanding, Telegram, if you're not in the US, when you load up the app, you get access to a Telegram wallet. And on that, you can do transactions on the ton blockchain. I mean, it has nothing to do with whether or not the messages themselves are actually, you know, secure or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. It's just about, you know, transfer of assets back and forth on their blockchain. But yeah, I mean, uh, do you use it at all? Is it interesting to you? I saw that um, the chain basically was down for a while. Uh, yeah. Yesterday, and it, yeah. like price did really. The price of ton went down a lot when Pavel was arrested, but when the chain went yeah. down, like no one cared in terms of price. Like, what do you think about yeah. all these things? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Uh, like the so, you see, like how uh, how if at least I, idealistically, like it's still a centralized uh, platform, right? Like it's it's more important that like the, the CEO of Telegram went to to jail than actually the network being down. I, w- I want to see this reverted, right? That's the future. So, but um, I did use just to toy around a little bit, uh, but Chorus is uh, actually uh, getting into more and more into the tone blockchain as well. And there are plenty of people here that know way more than I do about it. Um, but essentially it is, a, it is kind of a built-in wallet, like you said. So assuming that like you cannot trust the source code of Telegram itself, if this is the kind of the case, like you said, then I wouldn't trust, uh, give even, even further trust on, on, the, on the software part of it either, right? Um, that means that's why, I mean, they should be open source. Like uh, ideally wallets, I, I, I actually have to give a thumbs up for uh, Keystone, for example. I, 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 I'm not getting money for this, but Keystone has open source uh, firmware for for the for the whole uh, for the whole wallet uh, wallet software and and firmware. So this is this is pretty cool, and this is what you what we have to have. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I have been personally waiting for some sort of a blockchain related chat app where you can mm-hmm. essentially guarantee that the messages aren't being watched. I haven't heard of any. Uh, if there are any, mm-hmm. I would love to hear you guys chat about it. But um, you know, there, mm-hmm. some interesting primitives have to be built first before that something mm-hmm. like that can mm-hmm. actually scale. Yeah. 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 Just to go back to the Pavel topic for a minute. Um, I've been a Telegram user for a really long time. I'm aware of a lot of things that happen on Telegram. It's interesting to note 
that there are a lot of groups that may be involved in, let's say, conflicts in various countries that happen to use Telegram as a messaging platform in order to, like, they use it for all their communications. Mm -hmm. um, I know for a fact it's used a lot in the Middle East. It's like Palestine, for example. Um, there's a lot of people who are in, let's say, France who are using it. There's a lot of people in the UK who are using it. Um, and it's generally good enough for a lot of these people to use these and not be discovered. So to me, that means that this platform has actually not been fully compromised yet. Because if it's good enough for, mm -hmm. to, to be completely honest with you, if it's good enough for actual terrorists to use this platform, um, you could say there's a legitimate reason why governments would want to get control of, let's say, the back end of this thing and so they can sort of decrypt some of these messages. But that also shows that it is pretty secure, um, which mm -hmm. is probably the reason why... Well, I mean, there's... So, so, sorry to... If I can stop you for a second. I mean, I think there's, like, clear examples in, in uh, previous world wars where, like, the government was listening in and no one ever knew, right? Like, we found out 50 yeah. years later or something like that, right? So I don't know if... Because high risk individuals are using it. it that's proof that it's secure. Yeah, yeah potentially. Okay. Um, but I, I think like one of the things that it kind of shows is that, you know, it, the way that it's going in Europe, they're really, really trying to crack down on people who are, you know, protesting or doing things against government crackdown on you name it, right? Like there's any number of things happening in Europe that the government doesn't like you doing. Yeah. The, the interesting thing about, about, uh, Pavel's case is that supposedly there are claims that he was put on a wanted list while he was in the air flying to France. And there are claims that said that the reason for him going to France Macron. was that he was going to go yeah. and meet with Macron. So it's like, were mm -hmm. they setting him up so that they could just get this thing over his head, maybe try and blackmail him or something? Like, who knows? Yeah, it's difficult to say what's true anymore. Like, yeah. And certainly in Twitter and, and all that, but uh, but yeah, like it, if if there is a grain of truth there, because it's a spectrum, I guess there is a grain of truth. is is enough to be worried about, and uh, that's why again, that's why I think censorship resistance is paramount. Yeah, yeah. I agree. So a couple of thoughts here. Um, this this case reminds me a little bit of some of the issues that Apple had a few years back, although no one got arrested over it. Mm -hmm. where the FBI was trying to pressure them to unlock some iPhones. And they said, <clears throat> we won't, but also we can't. And um, I was glad to see that wasn't forced. I think mm -hmm. it's pretty obvious to me that there will always be a trade-off between uh, privacy and crime mm -hmm. um, to some extent. And we like, it's a trade-off we have to make um, mm -hmm. like allowing criminals to have some privacy for the rest of us to have privacy is, is like a really important trade-off. Um, a couple of things in crypto um, that I think are worth noting. So Zuko from Zcash has talked a lot about the importance of, of free and private money. And Zcash, um, my understanding yeah. is kind of best in class with privacy. And they mm -hmm. pioneered a lot of the ZK proof yeah. um, technology that's now being used by rollups. Um, I haven't really used it, but I think there's good things there. And one thing that I would like to see more of is a greater degree of privacy given in blockchain transactions. Yeah. So blockchains are like the opposite of Telegram, where e almost everything is fully transparent. Um, and it's relatively easy to track down whose wallet address belongs to whom. So I'd like to see more of that, you know, more use of privacy technology and blockchains themselves, because private money and, you know, private use of, of DeFi, et cetera, is really important. It's also kind of a harder problem than private messaging, because, you know, um, how do you know if Aave is solvent, if everything's privatized? And there are ways to do that, but it's not as straightforward as just end-to-end -end encrypting a, a messaging app. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my, um, so not a topic that we're going to focus on, but um, this week, um, Mark Zuckerberg admitted essentially uh, that he censored um, a bunch of uh, different topics uh, on Facebook, uh, some of which are, in my opinion, clearly election interference, whether he meant to or not. Um, and it's just an interesting reflection that that's okay. But, yeah. um, you know, building an app that is pro-privacy and pro-free speech um, 
that is what's being pursued by governments. Um, yeah. No, and, and and think about like that. What exactly what Red said, like that blockchain that is the opposite of this. They are also complaining about. They are also going against it, and the only subject matter, the only difference is that subject matter. Like is that one we're talking about. Uh, people are using it for privacy on like on, on their own lives and, and with actual sec with security at their own security at risk. While at the, on the other hand, we're talking about like finance and what we could perhaps get to know more about uh, billions of dollars of the Pentagon going somewhere or, uh, you know, <laughs> this, this kind of other other uh, shady bank businesses that we HSBC that are well documented. So. I I'm, I'm, I'm don't like to be put in the con conspiracy theorist type of thing, but I think that we, people, governments as well, they have to make up their mind. Either they are kind of pro-privacy and kind of uh, uh, free speech, or they are against it. And then like pick, pick your sides. I, I already picked mine. But, but yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's like, pretty um... clear. Sorry, it's, it's pretty clear which side the government officials actually want is people yeah. have to push back, which is help, you know, partially what we're trying to do with crypto. Yeah, 100 yeah. percent. Yeah, some people read uh, 1984 and, and took it as a warning. Some people read it and uh, took it as sort of a how to manual. Um, so that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really, uh, interesting factor. So let, let's move to um, other sort of uh, <laughs> bearish governmental news. Uh, this week, uh, the SEC sent OpenSea, a, uh, which is a popular NFT trading platform, a Wells notice uh, threatening to sue them in a claim um, that NFTs are securities. Um, so there's been some, I think, um, reasonable claims that some uh, crypto assets could be securities, but now we're, we're literally talking about photos. Um, so photos could now be viewed as securities. Um, yeah, just uh, I'll open that up to the panel, whoever wants to go first on this. I have a question. I don't know if anybody here knows the answer to it, but does the SEC consider buying art a security? Like if you just went to a museum and bought a piece of art off the wall? Yeah, exactly. I think basically no. I think no. And I, I know in uh, Gensler was questioned in a congressional hearing about like Pokemon cards. And he's like, are those securities? He's like, no. And he's like, how about if I tokenize it, put on the blockchain? Is it then? And then he's like waffling. And I think there's some really stupid double standard there that like they are going to get absolutely crushed in this suit, uh, in my opinion. I've seen another opinion floated that like, oh, well, they're not going to claim that all of them are securities. They're only going to claim the ones are securities that also promise to build like a metaverse app or blah, blah, blah. And then that there's some like there's there's some value promised. And to me, that's also stupid. It's like, OK, now are trading cards uh, securities if they're made by Disney because they create like a whole ecosystem of of um, experiences or or our NBA trading cards securities because it's it's linked to this, you know, this other, you know, ecosystem they have. And I just think it's it's absurd mm -hmm. to me. The likelihood they win seems so low, like it's the stupidest case, in my opinion. Also, speaking of conspiracy theories, that Wells notice for OpenSea came out, I think, on the same day that Trump's official NFT platform or Twitter thing was announced. So I don't know, maybe it's like a, maybe it has nothing to do with crypto and it's just the two campaigns battling it out and we're just yeah. a battleground. You know, maybe that's what it is. It's, it's interesting that two weeks ago, uh, I guess the Democrats were, were saying that. Um, yeah, we're pro crypto. <laughs> and yeah. Now they're now they're making your photos securities. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, there's some interesting, right? Like, if you like, for example, if you create a product and sell it on Etsy online for someone else to enjoy, and it's not like you're selling ten thousand of them to raise money to do a project. You're just, so, is this now going to qualify as? Like, it's just, yeah, it's just. It really feels like overreach. I mean, I actually haven't seen the text of the actual Wells notice. I don't know if you guys have. I looked for it. I couldn't find it. So maybe they're just specifically talking about projects where you sell 10,000 of some profile pictures and you're like a new project and you actually use the funding to build something. In which case, like maybe you could see a case for why the SEC is pursuing something like this. But certainly like a more proactive approach would be, hey, we realize that these NFT platforms are really can't be governed by laws that were written in the 1930s. So let's work hand in hand with you to come up with some sort of common sense regulation that everyone can understand and work with instead they're just dragging people into court and threat and so what's going to happen is 
anyone who's interested in working on these projects is just not going to do it in the States. It's going to be someone overseas or people are going to move overseas. So innovation is going to go someplace else. This stuff is going to keep getting developed and built. It's just the U.S. is going to miss out. That's all. Exactly. And my suggestion is yeah. do exactly that. That's the fastest way to get them to uh, do a U-turn there. Yeah, Bill, you said com common what? I didn't hear that. Started with an. You said, said common, common sense. What? What is that exactly? I don't. I don't understand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I agree with Erwin, though. Um, by the way, I think it does send a good signal to the U.S. that you're going to lose innovators, um, and I think the U.S. already yeah. is losing innovators. If you look at all the top, if you look at the top like 50 companies and DeFi protocols, etc., in the world, how many of them are in the U.S.? Very few, and all of them that are in the U.S. are currently being sued. All of them <laughs> but, that I can think of: Coinbase. Um, uh, consensus, OpenSea, Uniswap, mm -hmm. they're all being sued. It's like, okay, if you're, he, if you're here, you're going to have to have a big budget for, for lawsuits, so don't be here. Yeah, dude, here's the super frustrating thing, actually, uh, Rhett, which is you brought up this, uh, the fact that they, uh, you, Tornado Cash and Zuko and Zcash, right? So basically, Tornado Cash is a mixer that people use on Ethereum. If you know what you're doing, if you're like uh, someone like uh, Zach XPT, like, you can kind of figure out looking at Tornado Cash, what's happening? Like you put some resources in and figure it out. But if the people that are using Tornado Cash instead go use something like Zcash, it becomes much more difficult to track what they're doing. So basically what the government did was they wanted to you know, punish crypto. So they put the Tornado Cash developer in jail and anyone who's actually serious about laundering money or like a North Korea type is like, okay, maybe I gotta actually go figure out Zcash now. So they actually made it much more difficult to track people who are doing nefarious stuff on chain. So they're having, they're devoting a ton of resources to basically uh, making DeFi unusable or uninnovatable here in the States for us, while criminals just find better ways to avoid the authorities. Mm -hmm. It's like they're having they're having like the two worst effects. They're helping the criminals and they're they're punishing people who are just trying to actually develop a space. It's super frustrating. I think a, a good sort of predictor of where the U.S. could head if they keep trying to go down this path is to just look at where Canada currently is. Um, I saw a statistic a while back that said that, uh, over the past 20 years, Canada has lost like over a hundred thousand entrepreneurs now from where it was, let's say in, you know, the early beginning of the two thousands. And that is like, wow. that is a non growth. That is a, that is a net loss of over a hundred thousand entrepreneurs specifically because of things like this, because of the tend, they tend towards over-regulation overtaxing and then just you know instead of having this kind of sandbox environment where we're gonna you know let it happen and figure it out as we, as it go or as it goes and we're gonna have kind of like a per case basis that will help us inform how we'll make regulations in mm -hmm. the future they instead make all the regulations super strict right up front and then it just discourages people from even attempting to get into the market. It's a famous safe harbor uh, thing, right? Like that you can actually open for a period of time, thanks to see how the, how the market progresses and, and so on. And then you come with regulations after the fact, which I mean, that's again, the, the common sense approach. Erwin, we'd love to talk about Course One a little bit. Um, Course One, is a, as I mentioned, in the intro is a major validator uh, group in the world of blockchains. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like the world in which you operate that I think most people are not privy to like everyone uses the blockchain, but not everyone is thinking about how sort of like the mechanics work in the background. Yeah, cool. Something that I, I, I know a little bit more about <laughs> than, than, than the other topics. So, um, well, I mean, if it is like to explain like for the, the, the average user, um, when you're interacting with a blockchain via your kind of browser slash wallet, um, right now, you're still going through a centralized channel called the RPC nodes. That uh, actually is one of another my, of my pet peeves that we have to get out of it. But um, outside of that, that transaction actually goes to, uh, um, in the case of Bitcoin, it's called miners. But in the case of proof of stake networks, we call it validators. And specifically, I'm not talking about the Ethereum validators. I'm talking about actual validators. Another pet peeve. But what the validator does is that it uh, uh, will receive from uh, there's a, there, these transactions that the user send, they get into a pool and the validator will select a few to kind of mostly the most profitable ones, like for him, to put into a block. And that's what 
causes like, for example, the gas, the gas fees to spike because people are, there's a lot of traffic and you want to put all these transactions there. And uh, the, the validator is only bundling a few. So what is this validator? That validator is a piece of software, essentially. It's a piece of software that can communicate with uh, uh, other validators and together they decide if a given kind of block of transactions, set of transactions are valid or not. And they do this via consensus. So what we do, and that's the uh, important thing, is uh, we run validators for a whole bunch of, of, uh, of networks. And right now, I think we are uh, over 50. And hopefully, uh, with Avalanche, it's going to be over 100 soon. Um, and then uh, we, yeah, we run these validators, and other people have to run it too, because like I said, it has to be a decentralized thing. And uh, the, val the validator is, is needs to be up, needs to be kind of producing these blocks. Um, if this if this is not the case, then uh, we normal we normally get penalized in some way or form. For example, we can miss rewards or we can even be slapped. Um, so of course, one is a professional validator service. We have public nodes where anyone can kind of delegate to, uh, but we also serve like uh, businesses, for example, funds or or other things that like have. Uh, have like some some token from a network and they want to stake but they don't have the know-how or they don't want to deal with it for one or other reasons and they come to us and like said okay we run for you and uh, we get the commission so this is the main business um but we do have also like a the ventures arm as you well know and uh, also research which is uh, which you do but validation is the main business yeah Staying on validation, um, can you tell us a little bit like how the market has evolved over the last couple of years and, and where you see things uh, sort of shaping out uh, if you, yeah, over the next couple of years, if you have an opinion on that? Okay, we have, do we have time for this? <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> you're asking about three years in crypto. That's kind of 30 years <laughs> over to summarize here. Um, like when I joined Chorus, I knew already about crypto and was kind of um, mining Ethereum back then and things like that. Uh, already knew about Avalanche and uh, participated there in the beginning. Um, but the, the kind of, the, the point of view was like, uh, was pretty much, I think like pre, pre like the main bull market, like the last bull market that we had. Um, and there was all this thing about like uh, the ICO craze and the DeFi summer and so on. There was a time where AMMs were not a thing. There, people didn't know AMMs. This didn't exist. It was kind of only swap came with this, with this uh, simple formula, that, that product formula there, and then uh, DeFi summer happened. Um, and people were much more in, interested in like in uh, essentially like go what I call like more the kind of a little bit, perhaps I'm being polemic here, but a little bit more of the cypher, cypherpunk mentality which I hope that will come back again in the future. <laughs> but like it's that, uh, yeah, uh, censorship resistance is important. Um, we are gonna, we're gonna be experimenting with cur uh, token curated, uh, uh, what was it? Registries, token curated registries. We're gonna experiment with uh, uh, on-chain voting and all these kind of uh, uh, things. Um, but yeah, then slowly like the bull market happened and attracted a lot of uh, capital um, uh, a lot of VCs and so on. And I'm not saying that this is not good. This is needed, like, especially if you're in the beginning of an industry. But I think that at one point, and it's my, again, my personal opinion, I like, it's not really uh, my thing to, to, <laughs> to not say what I'm thinking. So I think like that we at one point, like we are now getting to a point where we have like hyper-financialization of, of, of things. Like essentially we are, we're investing in new, in new projects that not necessarily have an actual product market fit or application in mind and so on and so forth. Um, and we keep kind of reiterating this. We keep trading tokens for tokens for tokens and so forth. I want to, what, uh, what I expect to see like in the, in the, in the near future is that we have a, a more kind of product market fit uh, viewpoint on things like actual applications. And that's what I like actually in, in Avalanche that they, it seems to me that they are one of you, uh, the ecosystem as a whole, but the Avalanche as well in the, in the point of view of the BD, 
um, me in the Ventures Army at Chorus One and trying to kind of uh, get in touch with projects that build these applications so that we can actually get to the point where we, we can use we, the, the average user that is not here only for like quick games, but actually interested in using uh, uh, what we were just mentioning, uh, a Telegram, a permissionless censorship resistant Telegram chat, that they can actually do that. That's where I want to go. Or, and I, what I'm kind of working for and what I expect to happen. There's a long way to go. I, I, I do realize that, but I don't think that the problem is technological. That's, uh, that's the main thing I want to say. Like, I don't think that the problem is technological. Um, and, uh, but that aside, for the financialization, like finance DeFi is here as a tool to kind of bring this industry into, into its full potential. You need finance to finance things. And that's why we're here. We have to find this thing now. It's time to get the, the, hand, the hands dirty. Listen, Erwin, I'm going to ask you a quick one, just because you mentioned that you, you, so you obviously have a huge, you have a very detailed history of what happened with all these blockchains. And you said right now you guys validate about 50 chains. Yeah. Is there any that you right now feel like has a certain buzz to it? It's growing faster than others, or maybe ones that are on the decline. Um, what do you, from your vantage point, do you see a lot of excitement about any or any number handful of chains? Yeah, like I do. Um, I do see, for example, like Ton, Ton by far is like the ones, like if you look at the like short window of time, like the, the thing that got the most buzz was, was Ton, for sure. Um, and I do see also a lot of kind of uh, uh, attention into kind of the Bitcoin, I don't know how to say, like the, the Bitcoin DeFi ecosystem with kind of their layer twos, their uh, glyphs and so forth and so on. Um, this is a, a, and even Bitcoin kind of staking in, in some form or other. Um, this is also like a, a not. Luis is covering this a lot in our podcast. So if you're interested in that, like definitely uh, watch the watch those. Um, Just a quick question: Ton, Ton, do they have permissionless validators or no? Uh, yes, like it is. It is. They do. Yeah, it is for me. Interesting. So I wonder why the I wonder why the chain went down then. It was, yeah, interesting. Okay, maybe it's a question for later. But yeah, yeah. like I, I don't know the I don't know the details, but I can I know I know what to ask if I, if you want to know the details. So, cool. um, but yeah, so it is it is permission. Of, there, there's the the methodology of staking is a little bit more complicated. I don't know I don't know out of my head like the details there. I don't I, I'm not in that ecosystem so much. Um, but yeah, like, and then I would say, uh, what, what else? Uh, Solana is, is always like a, in, the, in the news, it too as well. So like that, that kind of is, is remaining the same. Um, one, of, one of the uh, PTs is that I feel like that Cosmos is a little bit on the back, back seat right now. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely not what it deserves. Like it, there was a project, a visionary project, I think it was, the, was the, kind of the, the folks at Cosmos. There was a lot like that Avalanche could uh, learn and can can still learn from that ecosystem. Um, yeah, so I think that's and and my favorite Avalanche like that that that's by far like it's a, it's a ups and downs, uh, but I think like October coming there will be plenty of uh, things to to be proud about. So. Yeah, just quickly um, before we move to ACP seventy seven, which I, I think is going to be our, our next and sort of final and bigger topic that we might spend some time on. Just um, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit, like what? Why are you personally excited uh, for Avalanche? I mean, I think we're all bullish for different reasons. Just curious yeah. about your reasons. I think like that uh, Avalanche is one of the few that are actually trying to achieve what I just mentioned before, getting to kind of end user application, get uh, application in the hand of users that can actually change the life, be more efficient, be that for banks, be that for supply chain, be that, um, yeah, for, uh, I don't know, the aerospace industry. I actually do say that a lot internally at Chorus. If in the next big space series, space faring project uh, that, that require collaboration between all these kind of uh, aerospace agencies around the world, ESA, NASA, uh, uh, you know, like all, all of those Chinese space program and whatever, these people cannot work together. They are like, they don't trust each other. That's by like, these are state, state sponsoring organizations. Like we, like in, on the U S they don't trust if a ship is fabricated in China and vice versa and so on and so forth. 
if in 10 years we go, we try to go to Jupiter and the whole project needs all these space engines to work together and they don't use blockchain technology, we failed. That's how I, that's how I think. Like the, this is what was promised. This is the technology that would allow this for us to get kind of congregate around and like in, with verifiable trustless uh, execution to coordinate and, and kind of uh, uh, bring these models to, work, to the world. Like, so that's what I want. And I think that Avalanche is going, uh, going that direction. It, there's a lot of work to be done, but like the, these, the news comes every time with kind of new uh, gaming is a big thing. Real world assets is a big thing. I mean, I could, I could just Google here a few of the, of the list of announcements and this is what I'm uh, kind of bullish on. One question for me, are you seeing any <clears throat> growth yet in any of the, what I'll call like non layer one blockchain areas? So like data availability services, um, sequencers, provers, deep in type stuff. You guys are going to get me fired, but uh, like, so no, data availability is a non-issue. I can say it already. Like it, it's like, and also there is no, there's no, no market for it as, as, as I can see it, like the, in terms of fees that they like, that, they, that are, are being brought, brought in and, and so on. Like I, I, I don't see it technologically wise. I think there is a whole other bag of, uh, what's it called? Bag, yeah, there's an expression bag of something to open here, but, uh, uh, let's not go there. Even some uh, founders of data availability platforms yeah. that maybe forever DA will be kind of a race to the bottom. And then, and for that reason, like we're race to the bottom in fees. And for that reason, maybe it'll never be like, like a high margin business or, mm. or even something that you'd be highly profitable running validators for potentially. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like the, the thing is like that, that is true because essentially when you run a validator, you are, you are essentially doing data availability, shocking news, validators do data availability. It's obvious they are looking at the block, they're executing and, and kind of uh, uh, recording it. So it's there. This data availability, what they do is this, that they don't have an execution layer, like a virtual machine that says like, what are the rules to determine if a transaction is correct or not. So they don't have to have state. And what the only thing that they do is that they check that they check that there is a block and it follows like just kind of the metadata essentially is right. And that's it. They make it, uh, they say, yes, I saw this block. That's it. I think that like data availability is a known issue. Like we have a storage issue, which is different thing. Like for example, our weave and, and Falcon and, and, and these protocols, they are needed, but we need a, a little bit more than that. We need variable data storage. These things are kind of binary blobs that are out there. But if I want to actually go and say like in a decentralized way, Think of like a, a Postgres database that has kind of a cluster, right? There's five, 10, whatever nodes like behind it, master slave, because again, they are not, uh, they, 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 that's the, the topology that they decided. It's not necessarily censorship resistant. So they, these things are running and I can, if I need, just query this database state immediately for what I need. We need a database of this sort, but permissionless and decentralized. So that I can query the closest thing that comes to that is kind of the graph, but I think that the problem and not to, I, I'm, I'm a fan of this protocol, but not, but to say like, what I think is a problem there is that, um, it's, it's too generic. Essentially. It's like, you want to make one Postgres database for the whole of this, for all the space. And. I, I don't think that this is really the way. I think that we have to solve this, for example, with having a SQL virtual machine, like a, so a, 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 a set of nodes, just the virtual machine that you can deploy for a specific layer one and use for the use case, for example, gaming or, 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 or healthcare or whatever it is. Um, and so data availability is just about, okay, I saw it and I, I keep it over here. And they claim that, uh, it's claimed that this is useful in the case of uh, optimistic uh, layer two, optimistic rollups, and and so on, because that gives you time to verify the proof. But to be honest, I never saw like a, a fraud proof essentially like that can that was really kind of uh, caught because the because of data availability in, in that sense. And what happens then? How do you roll back if this is caught? Like what do you what do you roll back to? What state and so on? There's many questions that that I, I don't I don't I don't see answers to. And the people at Chorus won't know that <laughs> here when we discuss internal. We discuss a lot. I can tell you.
But for example, ZK rollups, that's a different thing. But then I, again, don't see why you need a data availability in this case. I see, I see more a problem of whether you keep store, uh, the state storage, but yeah, that's a different, a different thing. I think I'd like to move back to uh, ACP 77. Um, so just introducing the topic, uh, it's a major proposal on Avalanche. Uh, essentially what it will mean is that, um, well, currently you need 2000 AVAX to validate in UL1. Uh, that will no longer be necessary and we're gonna be moving to um, what is essentially a pay-as-you-go model, uh, which will be moderated by transaction volume. Meaning if you have a, an L1 that doesn't have a lot of transactions, you don't have to pay a lot to, uh, to validate it. When I say you, I mean the L1 itself. Um, so this essentially removes a major barrier to entry for L1s. Uh, you could launch a, an L1 and it, it will not cost you a lot, um, depending mm -hmm. on your transaction volume. Um, and you don't have to fully commit to the blockchain uh, forever. You can you know, test the waters and then if it, if it works and your application works or your project works, then you can scale up from there. Um, another point I would, I would add, uh, not ACP77, but I, I think they work together. Um, so you can match ACP77 to um, ICTT. Uh, and teleporter, um, which essentially is a is a mes messaging system um, that will make it fairly seamless to move tokens around the chain from or from L1 to L1. Uh, so when you put these two things together, uh, it should make Avalanche L1s uh, very attractive um, for mm -hmm. for many applications. So we've been talking about this quite a bit internally at Google Pool. I think everyone in Avalanche has been talking about this a lot. Um, I would start with you, Erwin. What are your perspectives on ACP seventy seven? So I, I had to warm up to it a little bit in the beginning. Um, I was a very much like a fan of the idea of the ah, subnets. You select a few of the a subset of the validators, and you 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 launch your 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 yes your subnets called right. Uh, because I always thought like that the idea was very much like also in, in, in Cosmos in a certain sense, namely that in Cosmos, like when you launch a layer uh, an, an app chain, a Cosmos chain. Like there, are, there is a certain number of validators that will make the list because it's kind of capped. And so what tends to happen is that a lot of professional validation service companies like us, like they, we, we are there because people trust, then projects come to you and so on, right? Avalanche has like this limitless number of validators, but I thought, oh, it's even better. You just have to kind of uh, have a lot of validators and people will come and they will, you know, airdrop or, or a protocol like Google Pool would come along and kind of make kind of a curated list and the project just have to go there and, and click. But for my surprise, what happened is uh, like for, I got feedback from Avalabs about this is that when big projects want to launch, but the, what they actually ask is to, uh, is to launch their own validators. That, that happens a lot. Firstly, the launch with their own validators. And then this 2000 of acts indeed becomes kind of a financial barrier there, right? Um, so I see it like as, a, as an attempt to solve this and also a few other issues, like in terms of isolation of the, of the, of the running of the, of the validated isolation of, of the L1s, let's say like that, uh, for, for fault um, and a few others. So like, I think like that this new approach also pay as you go, making it cheaper for like these projects to want to launch with their initial own validator set. I think it's a really, really uh, good approach. And actually, uh, the more, it, the more it's kind of start thinking about it and see like also feedback from projects that are launching and so on. I think that is a, is a, is the right move to make. Like you have to, you have to adapt, right? Uh, if something's not working, you, you, you change. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see it. Um, and like still, what the, the main thing that I want to see is like actual app, app chains coming up because I, I, I don't believe what other people say. I think, I think app chains is the future, not monolithic ones. You will need monolithic ones for to be kind of financialization hubs and so on, where, or use case where high composability is, is necessary. But if you are if you're talking about like trying to substitute web two from to web three, when you go to the domain Google dot whatever, you're not you're not kind of in the same space where Microsoft.com is. Like it, it, it's just not the same thing. Like you, the actual data, the services, everything that is behind is it's just is it's not the same. Perhaps okay, TCP/IP is the same, but that's it. That's I think like where uh, app chains will be. Like the use, the applications, like will will be the will be the, uh, the separation layer, and then you just kind of copy paste.
I have to, um, I have to agree with you. Um, I think app chains are really interesting, and I think ACP77 is going to be a major change for a lot of protocols, um, including ours. Uh, but uh, I think it will be just generally extremely bullish for Avalanche um, and will open up a lot of opportunities for everyone mm. who is sharp and who is watching and who is building, which uh, well includes our group. So, uh, yeah. Bill, did you want to voice an opinion on that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you there. Like I, Erwin, I totally agree with you that app chains are the way that things are going to happen. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a question. It's going to, you know, I'm we're going to put you on the spot a little bit, but, um, so like even this more. happened with DY. Yeah. Yeah. Even <laughs> more. Yeah. So this happened with DYDX, right? DYDX used to yeah. be on, I think Ethereum, and then they basically got so much traffic they couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah. And then they went to Cosmos. Right. And I know obviously you're very intimately connected with Cosmos. Right. And, but other people have done this too. I think like, uh, what was it? Yuga labs, I think, um, mm -hmm. temporarily considered moving from Ethereum to their own chain. I think they ended up not doing it or I don't, mm -hmm. I didn't follow exactly, but there's this thing that's happening, right? Like the apps that get some amount of traction, they get, they hit some sort of bottleneck on whatever chain they're yeah. on happened with DeFi kingdoms on harmony. Right. Um, and then they say, okay, like we're going to go look for a new chain. Right. And I'm just wondering, like, from your perspective, if are those people like coming to you sometimes to talk to you because you have experience in so many chains? Like if they if they are like, what is it that they're actually worried about? Is it the upfront capital that they have to invest? Is it like the ongoing capital that they're going to have to pay? Is it integration with other chains? Is it just like the general buzz around the chain, the amount of VC capital that they think can be pumped into the chain? Like, what do you think when, when an app gets mm -hmm. big enough and they're like, hey, I want to create an app chain, but I'm kind of agnostic, like I'm not really a. Uh, you know, such and such coin maxi, what are yeah. they thinking about? What are they prioritizing when they try to decide what chain they want to go to? That's a difficult question. Um, I think, first of all, like a lot, it, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of, um, let's say, vision to actually do this step in crypto, like of going like from like, uh, I'm just a smart contract and I'm going to be a, an app chain in another chain or uh, something like that, because um, it, it, crypto is still very tribalistic, right? Like, and so you you risk actually by moving this, you risk move like alienate if you don't do a good job and so on, alienating the the, the 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 users that you have because they are already invested in that or that chain. So it's another thing that we have to grow out of. Um, and I do I I think like that. If there is a, uh, that being said, there is a kind of a, a natural progression for these, for these protocols. And there will be protocols that uh, they need this high composability and they will have to kind of, they will have to make use with the fastest kind of moto, monolithic L1 that, that can be, or the highest throughput, or like with the biggest uh, uh, available, uh, cheapest or biggest available state or something. There will be others that will go and say like, no, I need like, I, I don't need this composability. I just need people to be able to come and go. But once inside there, I, I, I can, I can manage. Right. And this is the, the, the best use case for app chains. And this is exactly like, uh, what I, what I expect to see. Um, in this, in talking about this, I think again, Cosmos is almost like a, a project that came from the future because the people there, that the, the initial developers, they were they were not smart contract developers. They were not EVM focused people. They already saw that you need to actually talk about and create this SDK so that applications, the logic of the application takes front front stage, front stage, right? That's the expression, front stage. So they go and build this and they have the app chain and, and, and it's working. So it makes total sense from the engineering side that DYDX made this move, despite the risks, right? Um, and they did this in a kind of a, 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 a smart way by saying like, yeah, these people can just can come and go whenever they need, like via the, via the, the, the bridging and, and, and so on. But inside when you're actually transacting with the perps that you, you, you remain this app chain, it's similar to what Dexalot is doing, right? Which I'm pretty excited about as well. Um, they're making these portals on different chains, but you come in and you're tra tra transacting on this app chain that is the Dexalot chain. And this is uh, only on the spectrum of going from smart contract towards an app chain. But there is also like the other axis, which is uh, permission versus permissionless, right? There's a, there, there's, there will be applications that don't need to be permissionless. The important thing is that the substrate, the kind of interconnecting thing, the DeFi hub, the C chain and stuff, 
the these are permissionless and some others of course i don't want tele the tele like a wizard talking about if ever comes a telegram in decentralized chat it has better be permissionless if there is an on off ramp crypto uh fear to crypto uh thing coming up better be permissionless but again or 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 this other stuff like that not necessarily right and this is all kind of all parts of the trade-offs I'll just say something quickly and I'll pass it off to you. One of the things that I really want to understand about ACP 77 is what is the actual realistic cost going to be to a project who wants to launch, like, let's say with 20 validators, which I don't think we know the answer to yet, but I know that the Apple Labs guys are trying to keep it very low, like very reasonable. Yeah. 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 If you go permissionless, you cannot kind of really control the number of validators, which is actually a thing like that is good from the side of the avalanche consensus, right? You can go. Uh, quite a bit more. You can actually scale uh, as you want, but um, the I, yeah, I would ex I would expect things like exact chains to be in that in that in similar realm as in Cosmos, like around fifty, a hundred validators. That's the nice thing. You 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 pay for the security that you need because users will launch validators if they feel that they, that it's worthwhile, right? And like we at Chorus, we will kind of run your validator if we if think it's uh, worthwhile. So it's like really let the market decide what the security you need. Don't dictate me that I need uh, full Ethereum security for, you know, playing a chess game in a decentralized way. Yeah, I think it's interesting the way um, Avalanche is kind of taking the approach of initially the idea was going to be around, you know, the 2000 AVAX per validator. Now it's this ongoing cost basis. Yeah. which could actually be, personally, I think it could be more interesting for value accrual to AVAX in the long term. Um, but another thing that I think is interesting about it is you commented about um, Cosmos and how they have kind of an interesting thesis with their app chain uh, model. Mm -hmm. um, I think when Avalanche implements ACP77, the difference between Cosmos and Avalanche is that um, Cosmos doesn't necessarily have a way to gain value accrual to the underlying blockchain, right? Like the, mm. the value of DYDX doesn't really add anything to Cosmos. Um, and that kind of exacerbates yeah. the potentially sort of not very profitable nature of their validation system. It's like very expensive to run. They have a POA system. Mm -hmm. You don't get more than, I think it's like what, 200 yeah. validators and there's a lot of there's a lot of costs that goes along with running one of those. Yeah, no, you're right. Like we think like so, it it, it costs to run validate, right? Like it is, it's not for free, and especially if you're gonna pay be paying kind of uh, on call engineers to to keep this thing running. Um, so when when this uh, kind of when these app chains come along and they want like a, to launch validate certain number of, va of validators in Cosmos, they go for this professional services one and they say like I will one launch with these 50 and then like these kind of tend to stay, to stay on the top. Uh, but uh, in Avalanche, I think it will be interesting to see what will happen. Like it will be, uh, if you launch a permissionless layer one, I mean, I can run from home, like I run like uh, the C chain or something like, and then we will see how, what, what the cost will be. I think it will be dramatically lower. Uh, that being said, I think like that's, there's still a lot of space for players like us because the like it was already clear that the demand like from this project is to launch with certain initially with certain trusted partners and certain, certain uh, uh, trusted services because you want to make uh, you bring your A game when you launch right um, and and to say to to your point of like the uh, the value accrual mechanism it's it's definitely it's exactly right and it's tied to the value of this P chain registry right initially this is also in, in the subnet architecture, it was what differentiated from the IBC model where you had to have like these light clients between chains to be able to communicate and so on. And then like the P chain was this registry that would bring the this the AWM, the, the communication protocol that, that scale and you don't need these light clients. But now there is another role for the P chain and like in this new thing, which is what you just mentioned that there will be kind of this registry that will be used to coordinate the, uh, in a central way the validator set of all these different chains. And, and this is what will allow the communication. So people will be interested in 
having your validator set register on the P chain because they want to be able to communicate and have what we just mentioned, this model of people coming in, doing their stuff, being able to go out and so on. You can only do this with the ICTT interchain token transfer that, uh, or like the, and teleporter, right? It's a new rebranding of AWN and, 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 and teleporter, I guess, but it's, uh, that's exactly right. I, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. As far as the naming convention goes, I think AWM was pretty good. Teleporter was pretty great. And now they're using ICTT, which is a terrible name. Yeah. So my interpretation was the same as you, Jared, but like, I think they're actually different tools. Are they not? They're exactly the same or they're, they're building on top of each other. I asked Avalabs guys, they said it was just a rebranding. Teleporter is ICTT. That's a terrible, it's the worst rebranding. Yeah. In, in the <laughs> I, I think, re I mean, look, look, they're smart guys there. They did it, they did it for a reason. Seems like a lot of recent rebrands are getting heat. Uh, Maker out of sky, everyone's hating. But um, so a couple of quick thoughts on this topic. It feels like this is a similar, there's like this trade off I've seen of like how much direct value accrual is there to you know, your token or system versus how big of a barrier to adoption is there. I think on the one far end of the spectrum, you have Cosmos where it's very easy to adopt, but there is like no value accrual to Adam at all. And I've even heard some people like Tarun call Adam like, you know, a meme coin for nerds, basically. There's no direct value accrual. On the other end of the spectrum, and this isn't like a blockchain itself, but Rocket Pool has had this interesting like internal... Uh, turmoil because uh, by having to bond RPL to run many pools, there's very um, like clear value accrual to RPL, mm. but it is such a heavy, um, it's such a heavy, you know, ask for a lot of big validators that their TVL has failed to grow um, for mm. like a year. And there have been a number of very large institutionals that Rocket Pools engaged with and said, hey, come run mini pools. And they're like, we don't want to have the RPL exposure. So that's mm -hmm. on the other far end of the spectrum. It seems like um, ACP 77 is is like a good um, kind of middle ground where um, it makes it easier to adopt, but there's still value accrual um, compared to what they were doing before. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some kind of balance to be had there. This seems like it's probably, you know, a, a better, better balance, um, mm -hmm. not clear to the atom side of the equation, but, but easier to lower the barrier to entry. Yeah. They, in Atom, they have uh, like this roadmap of, uh, uh, mesh security, I think it's called, uh, mesh security or something. And it has kind of different states different versions. And like uh, the, la the last version, I, by the way, I'm not an, uh, Cosmo expert. I'm, uh, I'm like, there are, there are people at Chorus that's probably rolling their eyes if they see this. But uh, the essentially, like the, this last uh, version of it, like it would try to solve this because it would be akin to restaking. And by the way, they, they came with this way before restaking was a, a buzzword. But essentially, it was it was the idea that you can, in a more uh, ad hoc way, say that uh, this app this app chain in Cosmos with this validator set will also uh, ask validators from uh, from Cosmo Hub, for example, to validate uh, some validator of the Cosmo Hub to validate the chain as well. And this is kind of a, a similar, not exactly right, but uh, similar to, to restating. And this way get some value accrued there. It remains to be seen, like uh, uh, what it was. I, it would be really be sad if this is a, this is like the, the, this ecosystem uh, just kind of, uh, yeah, doesn't recover or, or doesn't get that. I think there are good things coming on uh, over there. So I, ho I hope like a uh, landslide uh, like is going to bring uh, interconnectivity with the Cosmo ecosystem, which I'm pretty excited about. Perhaps the, the rejuvenation, of, rejuvenation of the cypher, cypherpunk will come from there. Yeah, please check out our podcast uh, with, um, with landslide um, that we did recently, where you can learn all about that. Yeah, so uh, we're, I think, I think everyone on this dais is going to be in Argentina soon. Um, I know Course One is having a, um, a special side event. Maybe um, you'd like to plug that as well and, and tell us how we can actually watch your podcast. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, the Course One podcast is available in the, uh, all, the, all the same kind of platforms that we have, not the centralized pla uh, platforms that we have. Um, and also uh, on the, on Twitter, if you follow the course one, like we always post new post new episodes over there, and I'm free to see um, YouTube as well.
Um, the, in regards to our side event, yes, we're pretty excited. We'll, like it will be our first kind of side event really at, during uh, uh, the, the, the Avalanche Summit. Uh, we've been in the previous summits, but this one we want to kind of make something special. And so we will be bringing some projects to kind of try to, I, I call it the L1 day. It's a working title, like I'm not good at this stuff, but essentially the idea is to bring projects that I think, uh, that we think be, we believe in and that like they come to bring services for developers. So the, the thing is actually target for developers or future developers in the Avalanche ecosystem that want to develop their app chains, their Avalanche earlier ones. And you shouldn't be starting from scratch every time. You shouldn't, like there are like crypto on off ramp, you, or uh, uh, business uh, kind of uh, business services, um, uh, validation services um, and so forth and so on. There will be a whole bunch of projects that each fit kind of in this value chain, I call, of kind of bringing a, an app chain to, to fruition. And yeah, we will be kind of uh, sending out on, on, on Telegram channels and so on, like uh, the notification and we'll see like uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to drop by and, and come and see, like it will be, it will be cool. Awesome. Um, Erwin, uh, thanks a lot for joining our, our, our panel. This was super fun and yeah, we'll see you, we'll see you soon.